Hey there, I'm Sharon Mark Taggart, one of the co-founders of The Curious Piano Teachers. Thank you so much for joining me on this video. Now this is a brand new series of videos where every month for the next 12 months I'm going to choose a piece of music and then I'm going to share with you a series of ideas for teaching that piece. Now, I absolutely love the work of Elisa Milne, uh, who, as many of you probably know, is a well-known Sydney-based composer and music educator. Elisa and I go back a long time, I think it's probably about 10 years now. Uh, we first met each other at the Royal Northern College in Manchester at one of the EPTA conferences and then she came instead with me for a bit in Ireland and presented at one of my teaching workshops here. Um, and then when my husband and I went uh, on honeymoon to Sydney, we of course caught up with her again then. So that's a few years ago and other than that we've really just been communicating via Skype. So so I thought for to get to let's get get this kick started. Let's use one of Elise's fabulous pieces. Now the piece that I'm going to look at today is a piece called Rhyme Time, and it's taken from a collection of Elise's jazz miniatures called Little Peppers. Again, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this. It's also currently on the new LCM Grade One piano syllabus. So before I go any further, I'm going to play it for you. Here it is. Okay, so let's look at the rhythm first of all. In this piece we have swung quavers and we have ties. Now, it's not particularly easy for a grade one student to feel the rhythm, get the coordination going between the hands. The left hand keeps the steady pulse. Uh, the right hand, the great thing is, there are only two main rhythm ingredients in the whole piece. So the first rhythm, you can see here we have the time signature is 2-2, two, two, so two men and beats in a bar. So the first rhythm ingredient is a crotchet and then crotchet rest, crotchet note, crotchet rest. And then the second rhythm ingredient of the piece, you can see here we've got a full bar of six quavers finishing with a crotchet and then you can see going into the second beat is tied. We've got a tied note there. Now, so that students get a really strong feel for the rhythm, I'm going to share a couple of word rhythms that I use with my students when I'm teaching this piece. And these will basically enable a student to independently read and tap the rhythm of the whole piece, the whole way through. Now, there is a time and a place for metrical counting. One, two, one, two, and one, two. This ain't it. If you get a, a grade one student to metrically count this piece, they are going to struggle for sure. So, I'm going to use word rhythms, uh, and because I've got a theme, I'm going to be renaming this piece. I'm quite sure at least I won't mind. And I'm calling it Paddington Bears Rhyme Time. So you can see here I'm sitting with my son's Paddington Bear dressing gown and a jar of marmalade. So you're going to see why in just a moment. I'm going to tap the rhythm of the first eight bars for you. And I'd like you to think about what words I'm using. Here we go. Yum, yum, marmalade sandwiches, yum. Yum, marmalade sandwiches, yum, yum, marmalade sandwiches, marmalade sandwiches, mm. Okay, so I've got two word rhythms here. When we have the, the rhythm crotchet, crotchet rest, crotchet note, crotchet rest, we're saying yum. And you can see there I'm actually showing 
the rest. Because it would be quite easy for a student just to hold on to that note. So, yum, yum. That's that rhythm. And then with this tricky rhythm where we've got swung quavers and where we've also got a tied note, I'm just simply saying, and I'm going to do it really slow, marmalade sandwiches, marmalade sandwiches. And that will take us the whole way through the piece. Now the other thing that I'd like to just briefly talk about is getting students to feel the meat of this piece because it's not written as 4-4, it's written as 2-2. And it's really important that the student gets the feeling of two beats in the bar. So here's what I'm going to do for that. Using a ball is a great way of helping students to feel the pulse. So for example, in this case where we have got two beats in the bar, one, two, one, two, one, two, bounce, catch, bounce, catch, yum, 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 marmalade sandwiches, yum, yum, marmalade sandwiches. Yum, yum, marmalade sandwiches, yum, yum, marmalade sandwiches, yum, yum, marmalade sandwiches, marmalade sandwiches, yum. So it's, what they're doing is they're feeling really what the left hand's doing by bouncing and catching the ball, but then they are singing the rhythm over the top of that. So that's another idea. Hope you have fun with that. And what we can then do is get the student to link the words, the illustrations that you see here, to the rhythm flashcards. Next up, I would ask a student to write the rhythm, let's say, for example, bars one to eight, on this chart, and you'll get this in the resources below, tapping and saying aloud. Yum, yum, marmalade sandwiches, yum, yum, marmalade sandwiches, yum, yum, marmalade sandwiches, marmalade sandwiches, mm. Here's another idea. Using the score, and you can see here what I have done is I have copied the both pages of the score uh, for annotation purposes. I have laminated them and they're also, you can see I've got them blown up as well, so the score looks a lot bigger. And the idea is that when you laminate the score like this, you can then use dry wipe pens. So the next thing that I would be getting the student to do is taking two pens so let's say we've got the blue for Paddington Bear saying yum, yum. And then when we have that swan quiver rhythm, we're going to use an orange pen and that is going to highlight the marmalade sandwiches rhythm. So I'm just quickly going to go through a few bars. So the idea would be that the student identifies these bars, not so sure how well you can see that, and then we've got this. Of course we do have one bar in the piece where the, the right hand, the melody rhythm, is a minim. And you may have noticed what I say for that is just mm, and then a rest. So again I'm not so sure how well you can see that, but I've got this circles in blue, yum, yum, marmalade sandwiches, yum, yum, marmalade sandwiches, yum, yum, marmalade sandwiches, marmalade sandwiches, mm. And the student then can go the whole way through that piece because as I say, um, even that little ending where we have, we've still got that rhythm. Marmalade sandwiches, marmalade sandwiches. And then a yum at the end.
So next up, we're going to look at pitch. And I promise you, I'm not starting a marmalade shop, but there is something that I'm going to do with that in just a moment. But let's just look at the overall structure of the piece. It's ABA. Um, the A section is in D major, then we go into G major, so the subdominant key for the B section, and then we go back to D major in, um, in, the, in the A section when it returns again. So I'm going to play it again, just the melody for you, and I'd like you to listen really closely. Apart from the fact that we go from D major into G major and then back into D major again, what else do you notice when you compare the A and the B section? Have a listen. magnifying glass over our ears just a little bit longer, what you will notice is that we have got the A section. It's just transposed when we go to the B section and turn it into G major. Is, uh, that you may have noticed is that the melody is just made up of the major pentachord. So what we've got, let's just apply a D for a second, we've got one, two, three, four, five. And so this is what I'm doing with five pots of marmalade. They probably thought I was a crazy lady walking into the shop today, literally just to buy five pots of marmalade. So let me just demonstrate. What I'm going to do with this is I'm going to get the student to sing the scale degrees. Singing is a great way to, um, to really dig into internalisation. If you sing this, I guarantee you, if, if you get your five pots of marmalade and you go away and do this yourself, you'll be humming this in your head uh, for the rest of the day, for the rest of the week. And of course, that's a really good thing for our students to do because it just means when they really clearly internalise, you know, sing first, be able to then hear that tune going around and around in their head, it's going to be fabulous for when they actually come back and play it as a musically shaped melody. So, doing some D major. One, two, three, four, five, four, three, two, one. And even just getting the student to sing up and down that uh, that pentascale. One, two, three, 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 four, three, five, four, three, two, two. Two, three, two, four, three, two, three, 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 four, three, five, four, three, two, three, two, four, three, two, one. And from there, I would get the student, who again should be able to write out the rhythm from memory. The rhythm, as we discovered, is actually not very complicated, it's just repeated over and over again. And get them then to write out what they're playing, maybe even before they, they see the score, just getting them to learn that. And then of course, you know, if they're playing that in D major, Get 
the ID. So what we really want to be doing with our students is getting them to really internalize this rhythm, um, this melody, and that way they're going to be able to play it with a lovely sense um, of musical flow. So yeah, off you go and buy some pots of marmalade. Have fun with that. So let's dig into the left hand a little bit and I'm going to go straight to the B section. So let me just play it through to you as it's written. students get to see the patterns. There are lots of patterns here. The first thing I'm going to get a student to do is find for me the root position triads that exist. Now they're not all stacked as you as a student might expect a root position triad to look. What we've got if we look at bar nine is we've got a G and then it bounces up to a B and a D. But if the student plays it all together like that, they can see, they can hear that what they've got is a G major triad. So they're going to just, again, circle that. When we look at the beginning of bar 10, we've got another root position triad. This time we've got an E minor triad. And then when we go to bar 11, we've got an A minor triad. The next bar also has an A minor root position triad at the beginning of it. Then we've got another G major root position triad. Look into bar 14, we've got another E minor triad. And then it changes a little bit just as it goes into the, the last couple of bars of the B section. But the idea is that students are not just playing notes, they're actually recognising the patterns, the triad shapes that exist there. If you want to go on and do a little bit more detailed work, yes, you could look at the fact that what you've got there is in bar nine, you've got a G major triad, and then we've got a B minor in second inversion, and then we've got the E minor root position, and then we've got a G major in second inversion. So if you want to get into inversions, then yep, it's possible to do that. But now let's look a little bit at how a student might practice that. And before I maybe just look a little bit further, let's just clarify that bar nine is exactly the same as bar 13. Bar 10 okay, that is exactly the same that you'll find at bar 14. And then we've got bar 11 doing this. Okay. And bar 12 is exactly the same. So instead of six bars to learn, there are only three bars. And I think sometimes we can so easily as teachers take it for granted that we see that that's what's happening. Sometimes we just need to make sure that our students are seeing that as well because it's quite exciting to discover that although you see six bars, there are really only three bars to learn. And instead of getting a student to actually practice playing it the way it's written, get them to outline the triads. Now what I mean by that is, we're going to play everything that happens in the first beat together as a triad. hands together in the initial stages, it's probably worth getting them just to again feel and play that pulse like this. Okay, um, and then from that point when they're really comfortable with where their left hand needs to move because there is quite a lot of hopping around in that left hand part. Then, once they can comfortably do this, then. So, hopefully.
hopefully that's helpful. Okay, so the last thing I'm going to look at is this series of sevenths in the left hand at this ever so cute little coda. Okay, let me play it to you first of all. Now that's quite hard. That's really quite tricky to place. So what's happening here in the left hand, we have sevenths going up and then we've got that to finish with. Okay, that's all in slow motion. So, how do we get a student to practice that? They're moving their hand lots, so they're having to place intervals of a seventh. So here's what I've got. You can see I'm quite a fan of getting things laminated. Um, just because you can use a baby wipe, rub it out, and use the resource time and time and time again. So, first of all, the students need to have a firm idea of what the notes are. So, here's what I'm going to get them to do. Focusing on these sevenths, which you will find in the left-hand part at bars 24 and 25, I'm going to get them to draw in, first of all, the key signature. Okay, so we're back in the key of D major again for the, the ending. And I've just popped in here an F sharp and a C sharp. And then, I'm going to play a note for the student, and it's this note here. And I'm just going to ask them to draw it for me. So, I mean, it can be, let's just keep it simple, let's draw it as a minim. And I'm going to get them to draw the F sharp just there, like that. You can see that we're actually going to move in in a moment to using the, the G clef or the... Um, the, the G Steve. Um, and then I'm going to ask them to, within that key, move up a fourth. So we're in the key, they're thinking in the key of D major. And up a fourth, they will be drawing a B. It's this B, and I'm going to get them to draw it what would it look like written on the treble, the G stave? So we're going to, and again, they could pop in the key signature again, and we've got a B there. I'm just gonna put the stems down for a second. I'll tell you why in a minute. And then move up a fourth. So we've been from F sharp up to B, up another fourth, it's an E and we're on this E here. So again, bottom line of the, the G or the treble stave. And then up another fourth, and they will write, they will draw an A. And again, you can just get them on each line to draw the key signature. It's always really good to get students to draw things um, in lessons. Okay, so get them then to play what they have just written. So we've got this series of ascending fourths and get them to play that. Maybe just counting one, two, two, one, two, one, two. And of course, when they go to play this, those are the notes that their fifth fingers are going to be playing. So get them even to do that from memory. But again, because they've been writing it down, it does make so much more sense. They're getting to see it. And they're also, in the score, we're moving from the bass clef or the F clef to the treble clef or G clef, whichever you prefer to call it. Um, and sometimes, again, that can create some sort of confusion mutation-wise to students. So then the next thing is we're going to get them to create an interval of a seventh on top of that. So a seventh, that would be on our octave, F sharps, bring it back. And they're now going to draw an E 
and again this is on the base clef so of course we've got our two ledger lines like that and then they go to that B they work out what a seventh is going to be again it might just simply be again you're thinking in the key of D major maybe playing the octave and then stepping back a step so we've got a B and on top of that is an A we're writing that as a treble clef note so that's going to go in there so so far we have got this we have got F sharp and E and then we're moving up a fourth to a B, seventh on top of that, we're playing a B and an A. I've got an E here, getting them to figure out what a seventh is above that, so they're going to draw a D. And the other nice thing is here that they're then starting to realise that when they see sevenths written on the stave, they will be, as in this example, line, misaligned, misaligned, line. That's what a seventh will look like. Here, space, skip a space, skip a space, space. So sevenths um, are going to look at neither. Both of them will be in lines or both of them will be in spaces with two lines or spaces um, in between. And then we've got an A, so get them to work out, okay? A seventh, so it's going to be a G, and that G is going to sit right above the G stave like that. Okay, so they've been working out. Okay, we haven't been looking at the score, that's not my starting point. The starting point is to actually work out these patterns. So we're starting with the F sharp going up a fourth to a B going up a fourth, that's an E, going up another fourth, and that's an A, and then we're putting a seventh on top of that. Uh, I mean, if you like, you could have gone E with the thumb up a fourth. It's gonna be an A up a fourth. It's gonna be a D up a fourth is a G. So in the same way that they're using fifth fingers, moving up like that, they could be using then their, their thumb. And then putting the seventh together as an interval. And the other lovely thing is they're actually getting to hear what a seventh sounds like. So playing the F sharp and the E, moving up to the B and the A, moving up then to the E and the D, and then we finish off with an A and a G. Now getting the movement of that is not going to be that easy. So here's a practice strategy that I use to overcome this. The idea is that we're going to rock back and forth on the first seventh. So we've got and you can see there I've got marmalade yum. Let's again keep this really relevant, really musical. Let's use one of those rhythms, marmalade yum. And then we could go into the next, so we're moving from there, then they have to find that B in order to go up another seventh. Okay. Uh, another thing is actually getting them to play and say. So F sharp, E, F sharp. B and A, B and A, E and D, E and D, A and G, A and G. It kind of links to something that we call alphabet strings at the Curious Piano Teachers and it's just where it's actually really useful for students to say aloud the letters. So again when they come to play it they just have they're a little bit more conscious on where the notes are and where they need to be. And of course then when we look back at the rhythm, I would possibly start with just keeping it on the pulse. So we have then got one and two and one and two. And then we can actually figure in the rhythm. Marmalade sandwiches, marmalade sandwiches, marmalade sandwiches, marmalade sandwiches. 
marmalade sandwiches, marmalade sandwiches. So I really hope that that has been helpful, that that's given you some ideas for how you might approach teaching this absolutely wonderful, wonderful little piece. And I would love, love, love to know how you get on with some of these ideas. And I would also love to hear some of your ideas for teaching this piece. So please comment in the comments below and um, it would be fantastic to hear from you. Thank you so, so much for watching and look out for another video coming next month. I'll see you then. Bye for now.